Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm Ross Grossman. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, a large biotechnology company in uh, New York State that uh, actually has been a, a big adherent and a big hirer of uh, PSM students. And it's my pleasure to get the opportunity to serve as moderator for this afternoon's Professional Science Master's Milestone Briefing. As I said, for the last 11 years, I've been the, the head of human resources for Regeneron. Um, I've also personally been involved in a number of uh, PSM programs, not only hiring students, but uh, I've served on two advisory committees um, for almost 10 years with the, uh, the Flagstone uh, Keck Graduate Institute in California, and for the last three or four years uh, with Rutgers University's uh, program. And I also have worn another hat. I, I recently stepped off the advisory committee and joined the board at uh, KGI. So I've got uh, a lot of perspectives, which I'm not going to share with you today, but they're all positive. Uh, I've certainly had a chance to, uh, to know firsthand the uh, the wonderful talent and the contributions that PSM students uh, with their heavy training in STEM and business uh, can make uh, to the workforce. Um, and I've also had the uh, uh, personal and professional satisfaction to have been involved also. So I, I'm a, a very strong uh, proponent of programs like this. Um, for those of you who don't know what the PSM program is, uh, the PSM is uh, Higher, higher education's response to a national workforce need. Um, these are hybrid degrees providing train, training in science and professional skills, like communications, finance, project management, and other skills that are highly sought by employers. Um, most programs also include an internship and, and heavy involvement in a company. Um, they're developed in collaboration, PSM programs are developed in collaboration with employers and are designed to prepare students for direct entry into careers in industry, business, government, and nonprofit organizations. The first PSM programs were established 15 years ago, and today we're celebrating the 300th program which was established at SUNY Cortland. Um, there are actually now 302 programs. We're heavily uh, weighted towards New Yorkers and New Jerseyans uh, in our presentations today, but in your, uh, in your binder, which I encourage you to take a look at, uh, there's a map uh, that shows that PSM programs are all over the United States. Um, in addition, if you go through there, there's some very interesting material, including a, a growth curve, which is, is represented over there. Uh, most businesses would like to show the kind of growth that PSM programs are, have been showing over the last uh, several years. There are also some very interesting articles uh, that have been written on PSM programs. Before I introduce uh, our first panel of policymakers, I'd like to recognize several distinguished guests in the room who are not on today's agenda but who have made significant contributions uh, to the PS, to the success of the PSM. Uh, if you could please stand up when I call your name, I'm going to do a, a brief uh, bio on you, and then uh, you can sit down when I call the next name, please. Uh, David King, there he is, already standing. David currently serves as the president of the National Professional Science Masters Association, and is also the dean of the graduate school at SUNY Oswego, and director of the SUNY System PSM programs. Thank you, David. Uh, Jim Sterling. Uh, Jim is currently Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Dean of the School of Applied Life Sciences at the Keck Graduate Institute of Applied Life Sciences. Does that all fit on your, your business card, <laughs> Jim? And a friend of mine. That uh, currently houses the Professional Science Master's National Office. Uh, Sheila Tobias. Sheila was the prime mover in the establishment of the PSM, uh, an author, consultant, and speaker on science, mathematics, and feminism. She's the author of several books on these topics and maintains an active role in developing and implementing projects to provide data and information in support of PSM programs. Thank you. Carol Lynch. Carol? There she is. 
Uh, Carol has uh, served as the director of the PSM program at the Council of Graduate Schools for six years. Prior to that, she served as the dean of the graduate school and vice president of research at the University of Colorado Boulder. Thanks. Um, we're going to hear later from the leaders of SUNY, so, of SUNY Cortland, uh, where, as I said, the 300th uh, PSM program has been established. But I'd like to go ahead and introduce them now. Uh, Bruce Mattingly, thank you. Uh, Bruce is the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at SUNY Cortland. And Bryce Smith, I saw Bryce, where's Bryce? There's Bryce. Uh, Bryce is the Chair of the Physics Department and the Director of the PSM Program in Sustainable Energy at SUNY Cortland, our, our 300th program. We don't want anybody to miss the fact that SUNY Cortland is the 300th program. <laughs> um, so why are we here today? We're here to review the progress of PSM degrees to celebrate the Milestone 300th program uh, and to hear visions for the future of PSM and its role in preparing highly skilled STEM talent from leaders in government, higher education, and the employment sector. Our program consists of four panels of speakers representing policymakers, university leaders, employers, and PSM graduates, and institutional founders and supporters of PSMs. We were lucky to gather a very impressive array of speakers today, and we're going to begin by hearing from policymakers who are leaders in supporting STEM education and preparation of a highly skilled STEM talent uh, pool. I'd first like to introduce uh, Congressman Richard Hanna. Uh, Mr. Hanna represents New York's 22nd Congressional District. He's a member of the House Committee on Education and the Workforce, and also served as co-chair of the House Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, uh, Education Caucus. On behalf of everyone here also, we'd like to thank Congressman Hanna and his staff for uh, uh, securing this beautiful members room for us. Uh, this is a rare opportunity for all of us to be here. Um, prior to his election to Congress, Mr. Hanna owned and operated a construction business, um, Hanna Construction, and thus has firsthand knowledge of the needs and perspectives of business. Congressman Hanna received his BA in Economics and P Political Science from Reed College, uh, and uh, the 300th PSM program in sustainable energy that we're celebrating today was established in Mr. Hanna's district. Uh, Congressman Hanna? Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Does this room remind anyone here of home? <laughs> no? Me either. Thanks for being here. I, um, you know why you're here, and I, I just want to say uh, I was with uh, uh, Dr. Bitterbaum the other day. If anyone has an opportunity to go to Cortland, go to his office. He is an ornithologist. I, won't, I don't think he's an amateur at anything. He's one of the most eclectic, eclectic and wonderful people I've had an opportunity to, to meet. I want to uh, welcome Dean uh, Manningly and uh, Bryce Smith. Thank you for being here today. I, I could talk to you about what, what it is in your field, but I'd rather talk to you about what it is I'm doing. Um, and I, I would, from where I sit on my side of the aisle, um, I have, um, I'll be candid, I, I am uh, disappointed often, um, but have found opportunities to do some good work in spite of uh, the uh, difficulties you see here in Congress. One of the first things I did when I came here was uh, join the STEM caucus, and I'm co-chair today. Uh, I also, you'll, you'll read in tomorrow's paper, Arnie Duncan and myself and um, Ranking member uh, George Miller from California will be introducing the first early childhood, early childhood education bill, and I am the lead and only sponsor uh, on the Republican side that'll for the entire United States. Um, and I could go into that a little bit, but I think if you if you're interested, follow the news tomorrow. Uh, uh, I asked if I could have a briefing on it, and they told me it's embargoed till midnight. So, uh, you know, you can call me later on. Um, I've read a, a lot about, from the, the kind of demagoguery about what is going on and what's wrong with the country, why we're not competitive, how we're not competitive, how the rest of the world's moving beyond us. And, um, how expensive college is, and we talk about the massive 
uh, college debt and, um, and the crisis that we see growing there. And what I know is this. In the last 20 years, 98% of the jobs that have been created in this country have been service jobs. Now, when you listen to Congress talk, you would think that, and when you listen to the unemployment rates tick up and down, and New York has about 760,000 people unemployed, slightly above the national average, 7.6%. The national average is about 7.3 right now. 2% of the jobs that we have created in this country uh, are STEM-related jobs. And yet we know that there are 4 million openings in this country. We know that through the work of Nobel laureates like... Uh, Michael Spence, that if we do not create those value-added uh, products that the rest of the world wants, we can't compete. We will not rebuild the middle class. And when you look at the talk about the distribution of wealth in this country and how it's become so lopsided, that isn't the fundamental problem in my mind. The fundamental problem is the gutting of the middle class. The, the upward mobility, which has always been a function of, for most people, uh, education. It's that thing that sets us all aside. It's what they call the great equalizer. You all know this. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but I want you to know how I feel about it and how I work. Um, one of the first things I did when I got here, I wrote a bill to allow everyone who goes into science, technology, engineering, and math to capitalize the cost of their education over their life. I was in construction for 30 years. I bought a piece of equipment. I wrote it off. Why isn't it the case that if you, the largest investment for most of us in our lives is our education, why shouldn't we be able to capitalize that at some point in our life? And why shouldn't entrepreneurs like uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, who quit Reed College, incidentally, uh, uh, I think he did the right thing. Um, the, People like that who want to create engineers, want to create scientists, understand the value-added nature of the, of, of the mind and, how, and, and, and look at that opportunity. Why shouldn't they be able, able to put 100 people through uh, any one of your universities and, and, and pay for it and write it off themselves? Because it's all value-added. And why do we have an immigration law that punish, punishes the most talented of us in, around the world? It takes nine years to get a visa in this country. It, it's obscene. We're pushing out people we're educating, and we're telling them effectively we don't want them. Well, that used to be the case that we had a, we had a, we had a hold on those people because they wanted to be here. Guess what? They don't need to be here anymore. They get frustrated. They leave. My point is that from my seat, there is a huge divide between that which is an investment and that which is an expense in this country. And the sooner this Congress realizes that opportunities to, to dedicate funds, like tr early childhood education, less crime, uh, more productivity throughout their life. Every dollar you spend on, on uh, pre-K produces anywhere from seven to nine dollars in, in value. And, and not only for that person, but all those things that we, we don't like, uh, unemployment insurance, food stamps, that there's that there are, you know, severe cuts going on right now, um, which I didn't support all of it, uh, any of the ultimate cuts. The, um, you know, pick, pick something that you look at in the social arena that has a problem you can fix a big piece of it. 30% of the kids in this country today are, who are living below the poverty line um, are those children who don't have access to pre-K. So we need to understand that. And I think you, I would ask that you take a minute tomorrow, look at what Mr. Duncan is doing. This belongs to George Miller and, and Arnie Duncan, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. Um, if you want to break the cycle of poverty, in this country. We can fault the parents for not reading to their children. We can fault the parents for not having a value system that allows, that, that forces them to, to do those things for their kids so when they're ready for, for, for first grade or kindergarten uh, that they're on par with their peers. But that isn't, for the moment, that isn't going to help because those people 
are already out there with young children. We need to take the young children today, prove to them that their lives are better, let them look back at their experience in, in early childhood education and realize that their children need it too. It, it's, it's the only way we're gonna break, the, uh, to me, the, uh, this awful cycle of poverty and frankly ignorance and a lack of a value structure in this country that is diminishing uh, the importance of education. Most of us get it, a lot of us don't. And the, the kind of class differences that you see growing are largely a function of access to education and a value system that supports it. So, you know, my, I'm happy to be here today. I, I'm sure there's nothing I just said that you don't know and know a lot more about than I do, but for myself and, and for Cortland and the entire SUNY system, um, which I have Binghamton University, uh, tremendous place. Arnie Duncan's coming up to our district, incidentally. Uh, you can tell him I said so, because uh, he's tough to get, but he's coming up. Um, I'd ask that you look at us in my office, ask us what it is we can do to help you, give us your ideas, watch this roll out of pre-K, and uh, if you wanna take a look at uh, my, my bill on helping people write off uh, their education, which I think is a eminently reasonable thing to do, um, give me a call, and uh, I'm happy to sit down and talk with you, and, and I'm not an academic, but I love them, and, uh, and I, I went to a place called Reed College, which is a very obscure, you went to Reed, right? You went to Reed? God help us, three of us. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to just spit out a few things that I'm working on, and it, it means a lot to me to, to be able to sit here and listen to you today, and with that, I'll, I'll retire to my chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. We had hoped to have uh, Congressman Rush Holt from New Jersey here, but the Congressman had an emergency at the last minute. He was kind enough to, uh, to send uh, a statement, um, which like uh, Congressman Hannes is actually uh, quite meaningful and, and, uh, and appropriate. I'd like to read uh, Congressman Holt's statement right now. Um, as a scientist, this is Congressman Holt speaking, not me. Uh, as a scientist, I want to thank the Professional Science Masters Consortium for coming to Capitol Hill, and I want to applaud your dedication to building bridges between science, politics, and business. The PSM is an important recognition of changing needs and goals of individuals and employees. After 15 years, the degree program appears to be meeting real needs in a good way. PSM graduates bring so many skills to the world outside of academia. They bring, of course, scientific expertise, whether in cybersecurity, molecular genetics, human-computer interactions, or any of a host of other fields. But just as importantly, they bring scientific thinking to the private sector. They help everyone in a company to, quote, think like scientists, unquote, to employ statistical reasoning, to recognize opportunities to gain data from experimentation, to remain alert to the mental tricks humans all play on ourselves. These habits of mind can be valuable in many aspects of business, even in areas that may not seem explicitly scientific. As the PSM program recognizes, an approach that is driven by data and grounded in reality offers a competitive edge in almost any business endeavor, from biotech research to advertising to manufacturing to retail. I'm pleased that New Jersey has been a leader in promoting PSM degrees since the program began 15 years ago, and I look forward to seeing what is coming, what the coming decades bring. Um, we're now gonna, going to move to our uh, university leaders panel. Dr. Nancy Zimfer serves as the 12th chancellor of the SUNY system, the nation's largest comprehensive system of higher education. Under her leadership, a new strategic plan for SUNY has been implemented. The plan, called the Power of SUNY, is to harness the university's potential to drive economic revital revitalization and create a better future for every community in the state. Chancellor Zinfer has been active in numerous state and national education organizations and is a leader in the areas of teacher education, urban education, uh, and university community engagement. She currently serves as the chair of the Board of Governors of the New York Academy of Sciences and of CEOs for Cities. 
She previously served as the president of the University of Cincinnati, chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and executive dean of the professional colleges and dean of the College of Education at the Ohio State University. She received her PhD in teacher education and higher education administration from the Ohio State University. At SUNY, she's been a strong supporter of PSMs and their adoption system-wide. Uh, Dr. Zimfer. Thank you, Ross. You're welcome. Um, thank you, everybody. It's, it is a beautiful room, Congressman Hannah, I have to say, and uh, it's a privilege just to take in the ambiance. But more importantly, it's a, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, I, uh, I thank you, Ross, for your leadership of this uh, celebration. Uh, Congressman Hanna, you are such a friend of the State University of New York, and uh, I look forward to reading what you've done and what you will promote within the Congress on early childhood. Uh, and uh, to my colleagues at Cortland, the 300th recognition of a professional science master's degree, I, I'm thrilled, so I want to congratulate Bruce Mattingly, uh, the Dean of the School of the Arts, and uh, at SUNY Cortland and Bryce Smith, uh, a professor of chemistry who's really led the way. And you're right, Congressman Hanna, Eric Bitterbaum is a force of nature as president of Cortland. I think Buff State is here, and there may be other campuses from the SUNY system that are represented here, but we do have 19 campuses engaged in the professional science master's degree uh, and 20 programs, the 20th being our Cortland program. So hooray for all the people who've made this possible. Um, Sheila Tobias and, and Michael Tiedemann, I, really, you have so nurtured this program and the growth since 1997. Uh, I think we're all indebted to you and to the Sloan Foundation and the Council of Graduate Schools. So. I thought, what could I add to the dialogue that might be of some interest, and I've entitled this, What are the 10 Necessary Ingredients to Ensure that the Professional Science Master's Degree is Sustainable Over Time? And uh, I've, I've cut it pretty short. There are 10, but I think it's reasonable to assume that a professional science master's degree is embedded in a university, in an institution that has to protect and grow and nurture the program. So I start with vision. Uh, Ross mentioned the fact that we have a strategic plan and that we see ourselves as an economic engine for the state of New York. So embedded in that is the professional science master's degree. If we're driving economic development, then we have to look very carefully at the students we graduate and the jobs for which they are prepared. And I think ingredient number one is the vision of an institution that places real value in a professional science master's degree. Second, uh, it's awfully big to say you're trying to drive economic development, so we've broken it down into a series of big ideas. We want a healthier New York. We want an energy smart New York. We want an educated New York. We want a global New York, an innovative New York. Right in the sweet spot of those big ideas is something called the professional science master's degree. So I think it serves a number of our big ideas. We also put on the uh, Wikipedia the term systemness. Uh, it's a made-up word. We've had a little fun with it. Stephen Colbert makes up words, so we make up words. But it really means that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So if we have 20 professional science master's degrees and maybe as many as 20 in the works, uh, this is really a possibility for the whole system to coordinate its work around science, uh, around STEM, and around this wonderful master's degree. Uh, fourthly, we're divided into regions in New York, economic regions. Uh, Governor Cuomo created these regional economic development councils. They bring economic developers together. And in nine out of 10 of those regions, and I'm sure we can fix that and make it 10 out of 10, we have a professional science master's degree. Again, driving regional economic development and a lot of state policies around incubators and hotspots that I think will help us move the dial as well. We have presidential leadership. The Eric Bitterbaum is not a rarity in SUNY. We have 64 campus presidents who are driving the agenda and helping us move the economic di dial. And where there are presidents, there are provosts, and I think my colleagues at, at SUNY would agree that our provost's office has been incredibly supportive of the professional science master's degree. Okay, Bruce, we're okay so far. So um, I would say number six, 
faculty leadership, academic programming, the transdisciplinary approach to the professional science master's degree, the way this can bleed into teacher education, and the preparation of STEM teachers and their rubbing shoulders with the students in our professional science master's degree is, is another thing that I think will help sustain PSM in, in our system and in your universities. And probably uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, I called it number seven and eight, see we're making progress here, is that this is a hybrid program. This is a program that is academic and classroom based, but it also includes uh, an experiential applied learning opportunity. Coming from Cincinnati, we love co-op. We uh, we actually think we founded it, but we could probably have an arm wrestle over that. Uh, but isn't it good that everybody wants to own internships and co-op programs? And now we're learning online that we have another form of hybrid that's part residential and online enabled. And let's see what that can do for the sustainability of the professional science master's degree. Um, and we think that by placing, our, our ninth point, by placing students in the workforce during their degree program, we can, beat, we can even beat the statistic that over 90% of all the students who have uh, an organized co-op education experience get at least one job offer from one of the sites where they co-opt. So this is really going to drive the economy. And uh, more importantly of all, if we continue to educate students in the context of the professional science master's degree, they will become carriers of STEM and science and the management of science, which will only help our economy, help our institutions, and help our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're, we're not going to let uh, Dr. Zimfer off the hook yet. We now would like to invite uh, Dean Mattingly and, and Professor Bryce Smith to come up to the podium and uh, to receive the certificate of recognition for the 300th PSM from uh, Dr. Zimfer. We have to come to Washington, you know, to see each other, but it works. So. Um, before me uh, is a certificate uh, honoring the uh, 300th Professional Science Master's Degree program. And as we understand it now, 301, 302, we keep growing, but we wanted to celebrate this significant uh, hurdle, this accomplishment for my colleagues at SUNY Cortland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of my colleague Bryce Smith, President Bitterbaum, and all the faculty, staff, and students at SUNY Cortland, I'd like to thank you for this recognition of our new program in Sustainable Energy Systems as the 300th Professional Science Master's Program to receive approval. I'd like to acknowledge the significant amount of support that we've received from David King and the SUNY PSM Consortium, the Sloan Foundation, the Council of Graduate Schools, and the Keck Graduate Institute. As the 300th program, we recognize the debt that we owe to the pioneers who preceded us in leading the way towards the establishment of this new degree. In higher education, we are in the knowledge business and we recognize that we cannot deliver a static, unchanging curriculum. We regularly update existing courses and create new ones. In some cases, we need new majors and programs of studies. And in this case, the visionary leaders who led the development of the PSM concept 15 years ago recognized the need for a new type of degree for the 21st century. We're very pleased and honored to have the opportunity to offer such a degree on our campus. This program in sustainable energy systems may be our first PSM, but will not be our last. This degree, as Chancellor Zimfer talked about, uh, aligns very nicely with SUNY priorities and with our uh, campus mission at SUNY Cortland. We recognize our key role in, in uh, the economic revitalization of New York State. And the PSM degree, with its focus on partnerships between universities and businesses, is, is designed to do just that. There are a number of businesses within the renewable energy sec sector that are excited about our new program and eager to work with us. SUNY Cortland has made a significant commitment to sustainability and responsible stewardship of our environment. For instance, we're a charter signatory of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, 
and we are committed to making a significant reduction in our carbon footprint. We've been recognized by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education with a silver rating in our sustainability tracking and reporting system. This fall, we became the first SUNY campus to use 100% renewable electrical energy. And I just recently learned that because of our efforts in this area, our campus has been, has been invited to participate in the EPA Energy Leadership Partnership. So it's very natural that our newest degree program should also reflect these same values and priorities. We hope that our students, our business partners, and our community will see that in the area of sustainability, we're doing more than just offering this degree. We're walking the walk in all of our operations. Thank you once again for this opportunity and, and uh, for this recognition and the chance to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you and congratulations again to SUNY Cortland. I'd like to introduce now Juliet Bell. Dr. Juliet Bell serves as the president of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. She's a scientist by training, having received her PhD in chemistry with a biochemistry concentration from Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta University, uh, and did postdoctoral work in biochemistry at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. While at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in, Re in Research Triangle, Dr. Bell studied an enzyme responsible for linking together the billions of building blocks that make DNA the genetic code. She was one of the first to identify ways to manipulate that enzyme to measure its ability to make DNA accurately under a variety of natural and experimental conditions. This work was important in understanding genetic disorders and diseases such as cancer. Dr. Bell has served on the National Science Foundation's Biological Sciences Advisory Board and as a consultant to the American Association of Colleges and Universities. The University of Maryland Eastern Shore participated in the HBCU Atlantic PSM Alliance that was formed to develop and coordinate new PSM programs that serve the needs of diverse mid-Atlantic regional employers and enroll significant numbers of African American and other underrepresented minority students. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bell. Thank you. To the distinguished member of Congress, uh, panelists, and all those assembled, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to be here with you to talk about the importance of the innovative professional science master's degree programs in the higher education arena and the impact of the PSM degree program in quantitative fisheries and resource economics at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. But first, let me uh, congratulate the PSM community and all of those who were involved in the development of these programs and on the growing number of programs across the country in the past 15 years. I want to particularly acknowledge the visionary leadership of the Sloan and Keck Foundations in 1997 for initiating the Professional Science Master's programs. I also want to thank and acknowledge those at my own institution who are not here with us today, um, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, who played a, an important role as a founding member of the HBCU Professional Science Masters Alliance of eight graduate schools in the mid-Atlantic uh, colleges and universities that esta were established to identify and develop viable PSM degree programs on their campuses in 2009. Each university in the Alliance received a planning grant from the Sloan Foundation to conduct a feasibility study to determine whether they would be able to develop a PSM program. That work and that planning grant resulted in our university, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, establishing our own professional science master master's degree program in quantitative fisheries and resource economics. As of this year, as you are well aware and just heard, there are more than 300 innovative PSM programs, including 11 in the state of Maryland, that seek to enhance the number of highly skilled professionals in STEM areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
This is truly a milestone, and again, I want to congratulate those who were involved as we seek to ensure that our nation is well prepared to develop solutions to the challenges of the 21st century. I have no doubt that these 300 PSM programs located at 137 institutions across the country have been designed to train and educate the best and the brightest. These programs produce graduates who are work workforce ready professionals pursuing careers in our state and, and federal government, universities, companies, in order to help to power our nation forward. Yet, I know all too well that women and minorities are underrepresented in STEM. Uh, in the year that I received my degree, my PhD in chemistry, I was one of only two African American women in the country that year to earn a PhD in chemistry. And even now, women and minorities continue to be underrepresented among the nation's scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and statisticians. When I became president of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore just 16 short months ago, I was very excited to learn about the many STEM programs that our institution hosts. Included among those uh, was the unique professional science master's degree program, as I've indicated, in quantitative fisheries and resource economics. My institution is 127 years old, founded in 1886. UMES is one of the nation's 105 historically black colleges and universities. We are also an 1890s land-grant institution. As such, we have a mission that is rooted in research and preserva preservation of our nation's agricultural and natural resources. So of course, this PSM degree program was and is an ideal addition to our academic profile. Not only is our PSM degree program unique among HBCUs, it is also the only NSF funded PSM program in quantitative fisheries and resource economics in the United States. I want to acknowledge members of UMES's academy, Dr. Chigbu, Professor of Natural Sciences, Dr. Oko, former chair of the Department of Natural Sciences, and Dr. Keen Dawes, dean of the School of Graduate Studies for their vision and foresight. Together, they determined that the university's PSM degree program should augment our well-established marine, estuarine, and environmental sciences program. Noting the national shortage of individuals with expertise in fish, stock assessment, and fishery socioeconomics, they determined to develop a program to train and graduate students in fish population dynamics and resource economics, two areas of critical need to help the United States maintain the nation's fishery resources. And of course, with us being located on the eastern shore of Maryland near the Chesapeake Bay, it was quite appropriate for us to be involved. The PSM program at UMES is built upon a core curriculum that incorporates the study of biology, mathematics, statistics, economics, fisheries, and it offers the two uh, concentration of, or two tracks as I've indicated, one in quantitative fisheries, the other in resource economics. In collaboration with NOAA, particularly Dr. Christy Walmo at NOAA headquarters in Silver, Silver Springs, Maryland. Dr. Chigbu successfully developed the National Science Foundation grant that resulted in nearly $700,000 over three years to establish our PSM program in 2010. Uh, though this program is primarily funded through NSF, our PSM program would not have been successful without the support of the NOAA Educational Partnership Program, which funds our Living Marine Resources Co a Co Cooperative Science Center. This is a center um, partnership with six institutions that uh, prepare students for careers in research, management, 
and public servants to conserve our nation's living marine resources. Through this collaboration, UMES PSM students have had the opportunity to engage in internships um, that are required as part of the program working with NOAA and other uh, national marine fishery service laboratories. The uh, professional science master's degree program plays a critical role in workforce development. Not only does our program seek to increase the number of STEM degrees, but it also aims to increase the number of women and minorities that will add a growing workforce to, the effect, to effectively manage the, na the nation's fishery resources. In addition to their coursework and internships, our PSM students mentor K-12 students to inspire the next generation of STEM scholars. Thus far, our program, which is small, has uh, prepared four students, three males and one female, who have graduated or completed their work towards the, the degree, and we have six students currently in the pipeline, five of whom are either women or minorities. Our recent graduates are employed with NOAA and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. The PSM program has allowed us to leverage partnerships between businesses, other universities, state and local governments, and agencies, thus helping the University of Maryland Eastern Shore to strengthen the role that higher education can play in workforce development by training our students to meet real market demands. As we look ahead as a PSM community, it's important to recognize the role that we play in preparing STEM-ready workforce uh, for the 21st century. In the face of our expiring NSF grant, which was made possible by the America Competes Act, our challenge now at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore is to identify new funding for fellowships to ensure the inclusion of women and minorities and the sustainability of this program. Continued investment is necessary to support the PSM programs so that we may continue the work of producing a diverse population of professionals in areas of critical workforce needs. So I thank you for your attention and I thank you for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the PSM program at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Thank you, Dr. Bell. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Sheldon Schuster. Dr. Schuster serves as the president of the Keck Graduate Institute of Applied Life Sciences, a member of the Claremont Colleges in California. KGI remains the only professional graduate school dedicated to education and research in the life sciences and prepares uh, students for leadership roles in the life sciences industry. KGI is focused on translating science into tangible benefits for society, tangible benefits for society, and currently houses the PSM National Office that reviews, reviews submissions for new PSM programs. Previously, Dr. Schuster served as Director of Biotechnology Programs and Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Florida. He received his PhD in biochemistry at the University of Arizona. We're pleased Dr. Schuster is able to be with us today. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Russ. <clears throat> and welcome to all of you, uh, Congressman Hanna, representatives of the uh, Professional Science Masters Association. Especially, I'd like to <clears throat> point out Sheila and Michael uh, for their long time dedicated uh, and visionary activities to promote what we're here celebrating today. Uh, so welcome to uh, the Cortland program, uh, to the, this great and wonderful uh, concept of professional science master's education. Uh, I'd like to say that it's a, it's a, it's a really fascinating uh, get together because I'm hoping that we're celebrating the first and the 300th um, uh, professional science masters in the country. Uh, now we have told everybody we were the first PSM in the United States. 
That may or may not be true, but since there's no one's going to argue today, we'll just claim that and it, 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 we'll just move along. Uh, the, uh, the, the program at IIT sometimes claims they're the first one, and then we, w when we have a contest over that, usually we arm wrestle, uh, and uh, then when I lose, I say, well, okay, how about, how about we're the first one in the life sciences? So we can have those arguments all we want. The key point is that we are all together growing this uh, great area of education, and I'd like to just give you a little bit of perspective from a different view. We've heard uh, about great programs in the large state universities. Uh, ours is a very different program, and it's based uh, in the Claremont Colleges, which is a group of, of seven uh, small liberal arts colleges. And the concept of the colleges is really quite different from the large university systems in that when we see a new need in education, we form an entirely new institution. And that's the reason why Pomona College was formed in 1887 or 8 or whatever. I was pretty young at the time. I don't remember the date. Um, and then, then they formed a graduate school, and they formed a women's college, Scripps College, and uh, they formed a men's college, which became Claremont Mechanic College uh, in World War II, uh, and a, uh, an engineering school, Harvey Mudd College uh, in the 50s, a uh, women's college, uh, which became co-ed in the, in the 60s after it formed Pitzer College. Uh, and there were six institutions in the, in the 90s, uh, and it became... Uh, the, no, nothing had really been formed as a new institution since the 60s. Uh, and in the 90s, my predecessor, uh, Hank Riggs, uh, who was the president of Harvey Mudd at the time, uh, got together with the leaders of the W.M. Keck Foundation, uh, Robert Day specifically, and some leaders in uh, some other visionary areas of education. And they realized that, you know, th this biotech thing might not be just a flash in the pan. Maybe there's a real thing going on there. And so they formed the, 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 the Keck Graduate Institute, and it was devoted to professional science education. And uh, we, we, uh, we uh, like to say that, uh, as I say, that we were the first one. Uh, it, it doesn't matter because I think we've enjoyed it and we've really thrived being part of this great organization. Uh, and, and, and I think it's, uh, it's been an experience. But what I'd like to do for a few moments is change the discussion to a little bit of pedagogy. And I know that's a famous a favorite word for, for all of you who are not educators, um, but I just learned to spell it and I promised I would use it in a speech, so here I am using it. Uh, but what I'd like to do is, is talk for just a few moments about the professional part of professional education. And the reason I'd like to bring it up is because I would hope that as we grow this strong uh, uh, um, segment of the, the graduate education market, that we give some serious thought to how we, in fact, incorporate that professional part in professional education. So if I could, let me just give you a couple of my thoughts about what professional education really means. We can talk about it, we can talk about hybrids, we can talk about what we think it takes to educate young people to enter the workforce, but that really is a core of what is professional education. If we look back at the studies on other professional education uh, arenas, such as uh, medical education, dental education, uh, clergy education, law education, there, there are some sort of themes that come out of that. And the, the Carnegie Foundation did a, did a fabulous study uh, and uh, so I borrow heavily from that, but, but let me just give you my thoughts on what the three cores of professional education are, and I would like to challenge the NPSMA to, to continue this discussion, if we might, about how to improve on, on all of those. Uh, first off, the, the overall goal of professional education is to enable graduates to do. They have to go into the workforce, they have to be able to walk into a job, walk into a company, walk into a government organization, and actually do things and perform things. Um, and, and I think that's not, not a surprise to those of us who have been involved in medical education. Uh, I would hope that most medical graduates um, would at least, well, I don't want to be the, the, exact, the first patient from a medical education graduate uh, who has not had other experience, at, at least they won't walk out being, being afraid the first time they see a pimple or, 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 um, or, or a little bit of blood. Um, they will have had the experience and they can actually go in and do, and obviously learn and gain experience. So that's something I think we have to sort of keep in mind as we look for what occurs in the real world. And the real world has limits. It has ways that things have to be done. So in our case, we've looked back at this and we said, okay, that means that what we have to focus on and think about are things like regulatory affairs. One does not get to do what one wants. One is, is coupled by intellectual property constraints, or, uh, manufacturing constraints, 
uh, uh, international regulation kinds of constraints. So those kinds of things have to be involved in sort of a core of thoughtfulness, if you will, about how we, how we focus professional education. The second component of, of, of professional education is that education is more often one-on-one, -on -one, highly engaged, than it is a large classroom arena. And the reason for that is really pretty clear. Because when students walk into the environment where they're going to be working, they don't get to hide in the back of a classroom. That's not useful experience. When, when, when medical students, just to take that, they, they actually have to walk around in groups of three or four. And at any time, the, 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 the professor, the faculty member, will point at one of them and say, okay, what's wrong with this patient? What would you do? What are you going to do? You can't hide in a classroom. And that's the kind of education that I think is crucial to consider as we think about, uh, about professional education. And, and, and one of the reasons for that, that, that is so crucial that we have to not, not ever forget it as we design our curricula, is that what we want to get, and we all talk about it, is critical thinking. We want our graduates to have habits of mind that will serve them as they go into the workforce. They need to be able to live and work and thrive in an environment where there are no right answers. That is a very different environment from a large classroom where one fills in little, little circles on, a, on an answer sheet with A, B, C, or D. So I would urge us to think about, about that kind of active learning that's, that's crucial. The, the third thing is that all professional education programs, at least in the United States, are sort of focused on real world experiences. Okay, students in medical school don't just get to learn on a model of a human being. They actually have to touch real human beings with real issues and whatever else happens when you touch human beings. Same sort of thing in law schools. It's moving down further and further in the curricula that students work on particular problems, even in their first year as, as law students, to work on real problems. So I urge us to focus on having our students interact with real problems. And, and I emphasize that in our case, the way we've interpreted that sort of mandate as part of professional education, a real problem is not one that someone just gives you as an interesting problem. It's only real if someone pays for it. Okay? Now that's setting an awfully high bar, I have to say. But in fact, every single one of our PSM graduates is required to work on a problem, on a team master's project, that a company pays $57,500 to solve. If it's not a real problem, they won't pay the money. It's real simple. Now that's setting an awfully high bar, I have to say, and, and <laughs> Jim and his staff have to work very hard to work on that, but what it forces are two real things that I think are crucial for, the, for, for PSM discussions. The first thing that it forces is the institution has to have a really deep and solid relationship with companies. Because one is, a comp that's, that's a fair amount of money. That's a real con commitment, a resource. And in fact, the, the real commitment is not just that money. It's the fact that we also require the company to put in <coughs> a liaison. So the, they're, they're going to put part of a person's time and resources into making sure these projects are successful. So it requires a very deep relationship with, with companies, and that's partially what we all espouse in, in, the, in these programs. The second thing <coughs> that it does is it enables students to work in a situation that's real but somewhat protected. As long as companies understand these are students and sometimes they run off the rails and sometimes things happen and whatever goes on in student worlds is, 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 is okay, but they get to work on real problems and come up with real solutions. So <coughs> I just want to end by saying it's my hope that as we go forward and perfecting and, and growing the PSM movement, uh, when we come back here next time to celebrate 600 to 900 programs uh, in, this, in, this, in this fabulous arena, uh, that we can have a further discussion about how to really make it highly recognized in the United States, highly successful, and, <coughs> and I would encourage a discourse so we can all exchange ideas about how best to do professional education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schuster. I'd now like to bring the next panel up. So this panel is excused. And this is business leaders and PSM graduates. So if uh, Christopher, Saba, and Shruti could come up, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'd like to first introduce uh, 
Christopher Babick. Mr. Babick is a 2004 graduate of the Huck Institutes of Life Sciences PSM Biotechnology Program at, Pen Pen at the Pennsylvania State University. He joined the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office as a patent examiner in the genetics arts in 2005. During his eight-year tenure at the U.S. PTO, he has achieved his master's level art designation and primary examiner status along with bronze me a bronze medal for superior federal service. Recently, Christopher was promoted to a supervisory patent examiner position in, te in Technology Center 1600. Christopher will talk about his uh, PSM and the re re its relative uh, nature. Uh, Thank you. What he does. Thank you. My, my boss, Gary, was supposed to be here today. Actually, well, my former boss, he hired me. Um, but I have since been promoted to his level, so I can, I can talk for the both of us, I think. <laughs> Um, I'd first like to thank uh, Ms. McAllister and Ms. Tobias for inviting me here today. I'm really in awe of where science can lead you. Uh, this is very uh, humbling uh, to speak with all these great, uh, great people. Um, it's an honor to speak here today uh, in support of what I consider to be the most influential educational experience in my life so far. Um, I'm very proud to be a graduate of the Huck Institute PSM Biotech Program and um, in particular, grateful to my advisor, Dr. Uh, Lloyd Escote Carlson, uh, who was, uh, uh, has been very influential in my life, my career. Um, like most upperclassmen uh, when I was in college, I, uh, I knew a general field, but not exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I had recently gotten back my junior year from a fellowship at the NIH, uh, where I did a lot of lab work. Um, but I knew that just wasn't for me. I knew that wasn't the, tr the traditional PhD path going through a thesis and, and things of that nature were just not a good fit for me. So it um, turns out uh, I am, you know, the, the prevailing theory is, you know, you're an A type personality, B type personality, uh, or you're left or right brained. I'm a mixture of both. Um, I, I do a lot of things with both hands. I don't know if that's anything to do with it. Um, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a one track person. Uh, I uh, wanted to work in the biotechnology field, but not necessarily in a lab. So I started looking around and I found the PSM program right in my backyard at Penn State. Um, this program really intrigued me because it, it emphasizes other aspects of biotechnology. Um, what I like to refer to as uh, the three other cornerstones of biotechnology other than just the science and engineering parts of it. Um, it, it discussed a lot of things that you didn't really get in an undergraduate setting that frankly I didn't know were out there. Um, it, the, uh, the program focused, uh, it lo or program looked at biotechnology in a much more macro scale, not just about your project, not just about where the science was. Um, in the program, we did analyze cutting edge science, but we also looked at the financial and commercial aspects of, of what's, uh, of science, and, you know, how to take a startup to a billion dollar multinational company. Uh, where does the funding come from? Um, venture capitalists, government grants, things of that nature. Um, also looking at the social and ethical aspects of science. Um, a lot of times the scientific community comes, becomes preoccupied with whether uh, some, something could be done, whether an idea could be done. The PSM program taught us to think, should that program be done? Should it be implemented? Is it, is, is it in the best interest of society to, to, to do that biotechnology uh, project? Um, I found this to be one of the more fascinating aspects of, of the program because there was no right or wrong answer. And as scientists, you're trained to find facts, black and white. And this was uh, sort of outside the box thinking and, and something I really enjoyed. Um, that led me, uh, led me to the third one, to, to the third aspect, uh, which was where I fell in love, is uh, the legal and the government aspect of things. Um, and that's, you know, we answered questions like, isn't a biotechnology idea even legal? Can we, can we implement it under US law? If we can, what kind of pr government protection do we have? Um, and that, of course, led me to patents, uh, where uh, I, I found a perfect fit for me. Um, the IP and the, the patent field in particular was a perfect, you know, non-traditional environment for myself. Um, it's technical work um, in, in a non-laboratory setting, and uh, I, I just, I can't speak enough about what, uh, how this has uh, been good for me in my life. Um, and just speaking from a patent side of, of things, uh, biotech is most decidedly not a flash in the pan. There's plenty of work out there, and it's going to continue for a, a long, long time to come. Um, eight years ago, I began as a patent examiner 
uh, as a junior examiner, and I, I used the critical analysis skills I, I honed at, at the PSM program. And I, I excelled in that. I'm going from a junior examiner to, to a primary examiner. We work sort of at a, as an apprenticeship in the, in the office. You work under someone, and then you get to, it, once you pass certain thresholds, you get to uh, examine a patent from start to finish and actually allow, uh, allow a patent on your own. Um, I, I excelled in that. Uh, I, I got my primary ship, and I, I do credit the PSM program for once I got my primary ship, spurring me on to a teaching role in the office and a mentoring role. Uh, we learned a lot uh, of those skills in the PSM program as well, and that led to me to, that led me to my current position, um, where I was just recently promoted to a supervisor in a in a management position now, um, and that again I'm still using things that I took from the PSM program. Um, you know, speaking skills and, and talking in front of groups and not just being in the lab, and be, but being able to present things verbally and uh, communication. Um, the, the invaluable tools I took from, from PSM are, are very simple. They, they, there was a, a lot of reading comprehension and, and writing on a technical and legal level, and that, uh, those are things that ha have just helped me so much in my career. Um, I, can t I will continue to use them. I plan to go to law school. I plan to stay in the biotechnology field um, and hopefully stay uh, for a long uh, productive career at the patent office. Um, I, I thank, uh, th I'm thankful to be here today uh, to talk about this because I owe a great deal of my success to the PSM program uh, and particularly my advisor who accepted me into it. So um, I'm, I hope I'm here for the next PSM milestone and I thank you all for uh, the invitation to speak here today. Thanks. Okay, I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Subha Madhavan. Uh, Dr. Madhavan is the director of the Innovation Center for Biomedical Informatics at the Georgetown University Medical Center and associate professor of oncology. She's a world-class leader in data science, clinical informatics, and health IT who's responsible for several biomedical informatics efforts, including the Georgetown Database of Cancer, and co-directs the Lombardi Cancer Center's Biostatistics and Bioinformatics Shared Resource. Recently, she's partnered with the FDA on the Center for Excellence in Regulatory Science program to develop evidence bases for pharmacogenomics and vaccine safety. Uh, Dr. Madhavan holds a PhD in molecular biology and biological sciences from the Uniform Services University for the Health Sciences through a highly ranked Indo-US collaborative program. Dr. Madhavan. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I also want to uh, thank Ali, uh, at, uh, who's the dean at GW, for recommending uh, this pair, myself and Shruti, to be here to celebrate this milestone event with you. Um, so the guidance that was provided to us was to touch on key points. I suppose I'm kind of representing the employer's viewpoint of someone who has recruited uh, a PSM graduate recently. Uh, and so I wanted to give you a little bit of background about our center and the kind of work we do. As was mentioned, I work at the, um, and I was a founder member and the director of of the Innovation Center for Biomedical Informatics. So what we do is data science. We do computational modeling, we do predictive modeling. Our motto is data insights to improve human health. So we work with all kinds of uh, medical data, electronic health record information, cancer data, uh, and we work very closely with um, federal agencies and with private sector and with hospital systems and provide uh, bioinformatics research as well as services in terms of analyzing that information. And what I call us, um, you know, nowadays my, my talk title is, it's not about big data, it's about extracting knowledge and small information from that big data. And, and that's sort of the area in which, um, in which we operate. So we're a, a small center within Georgetown University's medical center. We're about 25 people. And primarily, we're composed of um, um, graduates from either with either PhD degrees or with master's degrees. And we're really pleased to have recruited uh, a graduate from the from the PSM program. And I'll tell you exactly how we operate. We we um, have a, a matrix organization where um, teams of people come together. So you have biomathematicians, you have molecular biologists, you have clinicians, all coming together on on projects. And I think um, the skill sets that uh, the PSM program provides in terms of project management and communication is really key uh, to be successful on these, on these team-based efforts. 
Um, so why is the, uh, the PSM program and students were of interest to us? I mentioned, uh, I think, the interdisciplinary training. Uh, and I think training also in organizational skills and project management and, and communication uh, were extremely attractive uh, to us. And um, we were able to throw Shruti in, into projects and she would, um, you know, as was mentioned earlier, really hit the ground running uh, and, and uh, move, move the projects forward. Um, so I think this sort of um, interdisciplinary training is critical, especially in my field of bioinformatics because, um, you know, it focuses on a whole variety of uh, subject matter uh, expertise and experts that that come together on these projects. So how did um, Shruti make contact with us? Um, I think she had finished her PSM program in molecular biotechnology at GW and uh, was working as a student associate or intern uh, with another faculty member at Georgetown University, so I had the pleasure of meeting her then, uh, and we discussed some project opportunities, and we were really pleased to, uh, pleased to recruit her. Uh, she was very persuasive, I remember, in her uh, both you know, leveraging email and um, also face-to-face -face meetings to, uh, to present to us in a very professional way the skill sets that, uh, that she would, uh, she would bring to the table. So what are the kinds of work that, that Shruti does with us at our center? Um, she has grown tremendously just in the last one year in terms of responsibilities. We recruited um, her as a junior um, a data curator to really work with a biological databases uh, to extract information uh, on specific projects. Um, she now has grown to manage uh, a large number of projects, including um, vaccine safety, pediatric late effects, so we work with pediatric cancer uh, late effects databases. Uh, she works with neurological effects of Gulf War syndrome. Uh, and all of these projects are extremely multidisciplinary in nature. So you have um, you know, folks who are looking at um, sort of very specific research areas. You have people, you have sponsors um, from the FDA or from NIH. Uh, you, have, you have other program managers uh, that are coming together uh, as part of this project, and she has very successfully grown into the role of a project manager uh, to be able to, uh, to manage these projects and also to uh, explain to stakeholders on a very regular basis in terms of what's going on in these projects. Um, so we also, in the beginning of this year, in the beginning of 2013, we rolled out a new services initiative across Georgetown University uh, to really support our researchers in the field of bioinformatics. So as you can imagine, uh, this is a pretty complex field and requires um, very specialized tools and techniques and expertise to look at data. And um, so we rolled out these services to really help bench scientists and clinicians to look at data in very uh, useful, useful and interesting ways. And Shruti uh, was there right from the start of the services rollout program, and she manages the services rollout program on a weekly basis, works with collaborators who come in requesting those services, tracks them, and makes sure that those services um, are delivered. So she's really evolved from a junior level curator position to uh, manage managing large-scale projects just in the span of one year, and I really have the PSM program to thank because of her interdisciplinary uh, training and project management skills that has uh, really benefited uh, our whole center. So the last point I want to make, I was asked to talk um, just in general about the value of PSM in the industry sector as a whole. Um, and so I work in the field of clinical genetics, and I want to put that in, in perspective um, for everyone here. We, we read about big data, and we read about clinical genetics. We read about um, you know, DNA sequencing. If you look at the world's capacity to sequence DNA, to sequ sequence your, your gene, we're at about 13 quadrillion DNA bases per year. And that translates to three exabytes of data. So ex Exabytes is 10 to the 15, uh, and, and what, so, so what that means is, if you all remember the 1.6 millimeter CD-ROMs, which I'm sure my 10-year-old my doesn't know what a CD-ROM is, um, and um, so, so if you think of those CD-ROMs and you put this data on a 1.6 millimeter CD-ROM, you can actually go from the Earth to the Moon and a quarter of a way back just with this DNA sequence information. So that's the amount of information we're, we're dealing with here. And so in order to comprehend this data, it, it requires management skills, it requires data management skills, data analytics skills, uh, and, and scientific research capabilities to extract those valuable nuggets out of this enormous amount of biomedical research information. Uh, and I think you know uh, the professional services masters, the professional sciences masters program and the STEM program uh, was emphasized earlier on, really trains you in a a whole variety of aspects for us to be able to deal with uh, with this big data tsunami that uh, that we face today. 
One last point I'll make, uh, I'd like to cite the McKinsey report, uh, which cited that um, in, by 2018 in the United States, we're going to have a shortage of 180,000 people who have deep analytical skill sets, 180,000 by the year 2018. So we're not very far away from there, so just about six years from now, and I see the PSM programs as a key filler of, of that gap and, and that critical need. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so we know a bit about Shruti now, but I'd like to introduce uh, Shruti Rao, um, who's the Shruti who was being talked about. Shruti serves as a research associate and services manager at the Innovation Center for Biomedical Informatics at the Georgetown University Medical Center. She's responsible for bio-curation activities on several ICBI projects, including data mining from various uh, bioinformatics resources to catalog disease-causing mutations as well as identify molecular entities and pathways involved in autoimmune diseases. She is also the project manager for four other ICBI projects. She has a master's in molecular bio biotechnology from the George Washington University. Shruti. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ali Iskandarian, to invite me to speak at this event. Um, Prior to my master's in uh, molecular biotechnology from George Washington University, I got an undergrad degree in biotechnology from India. Um, as part of my coursework, um, I learned the basic science programs like uh, biology, math, chemistry, but in addition to that, I also learned some of the advanced uh, courses like um, molecular bio biology, immunology, genetics, and um, this sort of diverse coursework made me realize that I was really interested in this by in the in all these different aspects of biotechnology. Um, I didn't want to special settle down with specializing in one narrow field. I wanted to get into management but stick with the biotech uh, industry. Um, and while thinking about what I wanted to do in the future in my career, um, I came across the PSM pro uh, the PSM website where I found uh, or learned more about this uh, program. And what really attracted me uh, about this degree was that uh, th it was just the multidisciplinary education that I would get um, in the science and technology aspect of things as well as the management. Um, so I joined George Washington University where I got training in several uh, scientific and technology fields like molecular biotechnology and, um, and genetics and bioinformatics, as well as really enjoy learning about, um, about international marketing and project management. Um, I graduated in 2011 from the program uh, and was, um, was out on the market looking for jobs um, where I was trying to I guess, convince people how I could um, use my specialized skills from, that I learned from the PSM program. Um, I worked as an intern in bioinformatics and soon realized that I could actually use my multidisciplinary scientific skills that I developed during the PSM program in these different aspects of data analysis. Um, I worked on data analysis projects related to, I guess, cancer and then Gulf War illness and then um, there was um, there were autoimmune diseases and um, this training really helped me understand the different aspects of all these projects and manage these projects better um, during during my internship I had the opportunity to work with Suba for a while as well and then she offered me the position um, and um, I started off as Suba mentioned working as a data analyst and um, analyzing and curating data from next generation sequencing results and microarray data analysis and uh, soon got and I guess the PSM program helped me um, prove myself in these different fields of, of uh, or these different projects that came our way um, and now I work as the services manager as well uh, in, on these different projects for ICBI so I really have, the, have to thank the PSM program for giving me such a well-rounded experience and well-rounded education in this field, which has helped me, um, I guess, achieve my goals of working as a project manager and sticking with the biotechnology field. So, yes, thank you.
luckily, Dr. Ben Zion has been able to, to uh, arrive, so I'd like to introduce now. Uh, you've seen the product. Gary Benzion is a 26-year veteran of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, having begun his career as a patent examiner in the nascent science of plant, plant biotechnology before taking his current position in 2001 as a supervisory patent examiner in Technology Center 1600. He has received two bronze medals for superior federal service, along with a leadership action award and an exceptional career award. He holds a PhD in plant genetics from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Benza. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me tell you a little bit about the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. We are the premier intellectual property organization in the world. And one of the reasons why I can say that is that in 2012, the Center for Nonprofit Public Service ranked 292 federal agencies in the government, and the Patent Office came out fifth. But Hold your breath, we're shooting for number one, and we think we're going to be there eventually. And one of the reasons is because of the flexibility of the program of how we work. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit more. The Patent Office is divided, uh, Chris might have gone over this a little bit, into um, technology centers. And those technology centers are divided into broad cate categories of chemistry, uh, chemical arts, mechanical, and electrical. And I work in Technology Center 1600, which is the biotech, chemistry, and pharmacy art unit. Uh, and in 2011, the office employed 6,292 examiners. And as of yesterday, we have 7,931 examiners, which is 1,639 new hires or new retains after two years. And one of the reasons for that is that why we're hiring is that we have a backlog of close to 600,000 applications. It's down from quite a high number. And we're trying to reduce pendency when people file patent applications. Currently, it's at 18.2 months. We're aiming for 10.5, and we're on schedule in terms of bringing it down. So we need people. We need people that can do our job in order to make these goals. Another thing about the Patent and Trademark Office is that we work totally on user fees. So we get no tax, taxpayer dollars whatsoever. And that allows us to hire within our appropriation from that money to meet our needs. And, and I can say that when we look at people to hire into the office, we look for a very specific skill set. We like having PhDs, but PhDs aren't necessary. Uh, we, we have found that we need people who understand the cutting edge of science, who understand the meets and bounds of what exactly is going on in the technology. And in my experience, uh, Chris from the PSM program, he exactly fit that mo model when I interviewed him back in 2005 and hired him. I hired him right out of school from there. Um, one thing that his program offered was an intellectual property aspect to it. So not only was Chris versed in the science, but he also knew what IP was. When I was hired in 1988, I came in I didn't know what a patent was, you know, so, and it's becoming more and more important as our laws become more complex and the job that we do becomes more complex and more difficult that people have an understanding of science and the law and how they are applied together. Now, it takes an average of four to five years to train an examiner to the point where that person can work independently. In other words, a person could review a patent application, send out office actions, communicate with the attorney and the applicants, and arrive at a final decision saying that this is a patent that should issue. Four to five years. It's like getting another degree at a university. And it is that rigorous. You should see our manual of patent examining procedures. It's, what is it, this thick now, Chris? Yeah. yeah and it changes because we're subject to the laws uh, of the United States, including the Supreme Court, of course. And some recent decisions that have come down from that have completely changed our view of how we do a number of things. 
So we have to be up on top of that. So we need people who can understand that. And again, in Chris's case, the program that he came out of presented that information. And again, as I said earlier, we need people that understand biotechnology, but I don't just mean understand what the me word means. I mean understand the nuts and bolts, the meats and bounds, the actual technology, who've actually done the technology in the lab, who know what uh, PCR is, who know what LAMP is, who know what all these technologies are, because they get these applications and they have to understand them. We can't have people who come in and have to scratch their head and say, I don't understand this science. We can teach people the law, and we do to a large extent, but we can't teach people really the science. So we need people that have a foundation in that science. We need people who can think, think independently, because once you get to the position where you're making decisions, you have to make the decision, be able to live with it, and then move on and pick up the next application. We are a high production organization. We produce a tremendous amount of work. The average examiner probably produces 100 to 200 pages of work a, a, a bi week, Chris. Absolutely. You know, he's finding out now because now he has his own little group of children to, uh, to mentor. <laughs> and we need people that can speak effectively and convincingly and do the same thing in writing. So basically, we need an all around Captain America. Right? That's what we need. <laughs> Captain America, stand up, show your... <laughs> and, and in my experience, the PSM graduates that I've been familiar with, that I've met, meet, these, meet our needs in these areas. Um, I became aware of Chris through a recommendation from a previous PSM hire uh, at the USPTO. What interested me when I first heard about Chris of course, was the IP component of his degree. I had never heard of any such thing before. And I think, I don't know for sure, but I think the, the program that you graduated from is the only one in the country that, that has that aspect to it? One of very few. Okay. Okay. Uh, and from our interaction in the interview at that time with Chris, which I think he'll tell you was probably fairly rigorous uh, with eight people asking him questions continually, um, he showed the ability to think on his feet. He proved that he could handle good arguments. He admitted when he didn't know something. He told us when he did. And it was very refreshing. He actually thought I wasn't going to hire him after the interview, but, <laughs> but uh, I did. Um, and so, so Chris came out of the Hux Institute program, a master's in biotechnology. And the other person that I'm familiar with came out of uh, program from UConn, the Applied Genetics program. And as I said, both of those people are, are uh, and I don't want to inflate Chris, cover your ears, uh, you know, are, are superb people. In fact, give Chris another 10, 15 years, I think he'll be running the agency. No, I'm not. Well, <laughs> that's, that's what I think. Um, and, you know, I wanted to say, uh, it's unfortunate that I'm only familiar with two PSM graduates. There may be more in the organization, but we are so large and so put into disciplines that I don't know if there are others. And there's no way for me to find that out except to go to each supervisor and say, and there's 600 supervisors, did you hire somebody from the program? And another is, you know, it's unfortunate in that because it's unfortunate for the PTO because the PTO really, the US PTO, I should say, really needs people who can understand this technology the way that Chris was able to when he first came in. Because we need to hire people. We are hiring in 2014. The exact number I don't know yet, we haven't gotten our allocations. But we really need people who have a, a cutting edge understanding of technology and have an interest in the intellectual property aspect of it. What value does um, PSM graduates add to us? Although we hire people with bachelor's of science degrees, uh, that really doesn't tell us much about how well the person can handle the science. Maybe the most brilliant person in the world, but if the person hasn't written papers, hasn't been on a grant proposal, hasn't done additional work in a lab that is appropriate to the discipline that we're going to hire them in, we don't really know if that person will be able to meet our needs. So we take a chance. You know, in Chris's instance, it wasn't much of a chance at all because coming from the institute that he did, and coming with the background he did, I was positive he was going to do well. 
Uh, so the best thing I can say about uh, PSM graduates is that we need more of them. So please send them to us. Thank you. Thank you. Our last uh, panel is institutional founders and supporters of PSM. If uh, Deborah Stewart and Michael Teitelbaum could come up, I'd appreciate it. Dr. Stewart serves as the president of the Council of Graduate Schools, the leading organization dedicated to the improvement and advancement of graduate education domestically and globally. Under her leadership, the council launched a series of projects designed to strengthen the capacity of member universities and to prepare graduate students to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Major initiatives uh, addressed uh, PhD and master's completion and attrition and new approaches to science master's education, specifically the PSM. Uh, from 2001 to 2012, um, CGS partnered with the Alfred, Sloan Found Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to extend the PSM through the development of programs at master's focused institutions. Dr. Stewart received her PhD in political science from the Univers University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, please welcome Dr. Stewart. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the only opportunity I have to see Michael Teitelbaum these days, since he's not hanging out at the Sloan Foundation as much as he has in the past. So it's just an extraordinary pleasure to be here. Um, the Council of Graduate Schools has long been invested in improving and advancing graduate education and the particular opportunity to do this in master's education was really a, a passion of my predecessor, but we never actually found the vehicle to do this in a really important and um, innovative way until the PSM came along. We began our formal partnership with the Sloan Foundation in 2001. Uh, at that time, there were a handful of programs uh, spread around the country. But we saw this as an opportunity to do a couple of things. First, we saw it as an opportunity to meet a really compelling need in the workforce, a need in the workforce that had been strongly articulated to us by, I see my friend Carol Lynch in the audience, by a workshop that she had organized when she was with us as the NSF CGS uh, Dean in Residence, in which uh, members of the Science Foundation staff were, and, and uh, others who were attendees at this workshop were speaking with a passion about the need to fill this huge gap in, in the scientific workforce. But we also saw it as a vehicle for driving innovation more generally in graduate education. We saw it as a vehicle for finding ways to legitimize and promote professional development as part of graduate education. We saw it as a way to uh, advance um, the strong investment of the corporate sector in graduate education. And we saw it as a way of getting an important piece of graduate education accomplished in a rather short period of time. That's been a challenge for us in graduate education. Uh, and, and we saw the PSM as a way to do this. Last year, we were delighted to turn uh, the CGS responsibilities for particularly the affiliation process, but also the broader promulgation of the PSM over to um, our wonderful member, the Keck Graduate Institute, and under the leadership of Jim Sterling and his colleagues uh, at Keck, they have been doing just a spectacular job in carrying on the work that, that we began with the Sloan Foundation. Now, I know you've probably been talking a lot about numbers of various kinds today, uh, and those of you who know me know that I like numbers. Uh, this 300 number, this is a good number. Uh, this looks like a very good number, uh, far cry from uh, the, the numbers that we had in the early 2000s. Today, over 6,000 students are enrolled in PSM, PSM programs worldwide. And, and uh, Gary, uh, just to speak about growth, uh, the Patent Office may be growing. But uh, we've added in two to three years over 25% doubling, going, added 25% more 
uh, in terms of enrollees to our PSM programs. So, so uh, the, the patent office and the PSM are growing together. And the interesting thing about the recent growth in the PSM is that uh, it, it, it's no longer a, just a white male thing, not to say anything about white males. Uh, Michael, especially old white males, I'm very sensitive about saying things about old white males, but, but it's, it's now very diverse by gender and ethnicity. It's actually even diverse by citizenship, which is, which is just a great development. Uh, but, you know, in, in the world in which we live, the important thing to talk about is what happens to people when they graduate. At the end of the day, the whole account accountability movement in higher education today is about what happens to people when they complete. So uh, we actually have numbers on this, uh, which is a good thing because uh, I can't tell you how often I turn to the PSM when I'm asked about what happens to all these people who get graduate degrees. Well, I very quickly say almost 80% of the people who get PSMs in America very quickly find employment. Uh, we survey them in June, and 78% um, indicate that they have a job. But the more remarkable thing is that 91% in the most recent survey indicated that they were working in their field. That these students are not just taking second, third, or fourth place, uh, fourth choice jobs outside of their field. They're employed, and they're employed in the areas in which they are trained. Uh, most PSM students end up in the private sector, about two-thirds, but a third end up in really important jobs as well in the nonprofit sector and in government. Uh, from a CGS point of view, the PSM is terrific, not just because it was a success, but we do like successes and it's very important to have successes, but because it was a vehicle for us of demonstrating a way in which one could really fundamentally innovate in graduate education and innovate in a way that it would take. And innovate in a way that for the most part, universities did on themselves and for the most part, universities did on their own dollar. It's a wonderful exemplar of innovation in general and in specifically innovation in graduate education. Huge, huge uh, uh, thanks need to be offered to the Sloan Foundation uh, and Michael Teitelbaum in particular. I mean, even within the Sloan Foundation, this guy just drove them crazy all the time about supporting the PSM. Uh, without this kind of private foundation support, it's very, very difficult to get this kind of innovation off the ground, and Michael had much to do with its success. So thank you so much to all of you. I see so many people in the audience who've been involved with the PSM for all of these years. Your leadership, of course, is hugely important in making this happen, uh, and you, in combination with money bags here, uh, has, ha have... Uh, have resulted in a great success. So congratulations for your good work, and now I'll share the podium with Michael. Thank you, and I'd now like to introduce our last panelist, Michael Teitelbaum. Um, Michael currently serves as senior advisor to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, where he advises the foundation on the management of its professional science master's programs. Previously, Dr. Teitelbaum served as program director for the foundation and was responsible for overseeing the number of grant-making programs, uh, a number of grant-making programs, including the Sloan Research Fellowships and the Professional Science Master's Program and the Science and Engineering Workforce Program, among others. Dr. Teitelbaum is a demographer educated at Reed College and at Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He has held numerous high-profile academic and public policy positions and publishes extensively in scientific and popular journals. Dr. Tuttle. Well, I have to say this is the first time I, I, I spent two years on the Hill running a congressional committee and a staff director, and it's the first time I've been in a, an office of the Congress in which there were three Reed College graduates in the same room. So that's quite a shock, really. Um, I have only a, a few minutes, uh, so um, I just want to say that um, I was asked to say a word about the Sloan Foundation, and uh, it will be a sentence, really, about the Sloan Foundation. It's, it's an old American foundation based in New York, established by Alfred P. Sloan, Jr., who was the man who built General Motors from a essentially bankrupt company in 1921 
to I think the largest multinational company when he retired as chairman in 1952, I think, and I guess you could say it was downhill from there as far as General Motors was concerned. And he endowed uh, the Sloan Foundation, uh, but also the Sloan Kettering Cancer Research Institute and the Sloan School of Management at MIT. The Sloan Foundation is one of the too few U.S. foundations that support science, mathematics, engineering, economics, and related fields. And it's long been interested in ensuring that careers in these fields are attractive enough to attract the best, the very best students. And also that graduates of these programs have the skills that employers are really looking for. In the 1990s, we became aware of some major problems in both of those regards, a major gap and a major mismatch. The U.S. Um, STEM education or science, technology, engineering, mathematics education was really world class and still is at the bachelor's level, whatever you may read in the newspapers, and at the Ph.D. level, still world class, top leadership institutions right across the board. But a B.A., in which the U.S. was very strong and still is, was no longer sufficient, really, to be a scientist. And career paths for PhDs were showing signs of uh, becoming less attractive to U.S. students. There was apparent oversupply in many fields. The time to degree was stretching out, and the uh, career prospects were uncertain. Uh, we talked um, about this with many employers of scientists and engineers, and we listened to them. It's a good way to start. And they all told us they really wanted to hire scientists and engineers with graduate levels of education, that the bachelor's level was really not sufficient in uh, insight and knowledge for what they needed. Uh, but they couldn't find many such graduate level <laughs> educated scientists and engineers who also had the knowledge they would need to succeed in their firms in management, in communications, in teamwork, in IT, in IP, or whatever the field might be, regulatory affairs, each field is different, but they all needed more than, plus, they, they needed more than the high-level graduate scientific, mathematical, or engineering skills. Uh, this was the goal of the Professional Science Master's Initiative, to rectify these gaps and mismatches, and I think you've heard that the rest is history. It's a pretty short history. Fifteen years is but a moment in graduate education. But it has uh, been the history and it uh, has been, I would say, uh, a quite remarkable success. Now, U.S. universities are often criticized, sometimes in the, in the buildings located near here, uh, of being out of touch with the needs of the economy, of producing people who are not prepared to go into the workforce uh, and not producing the kinds of graduates that the economy really needs. Well, here we have the opposite of that. U.S. graduate schools have really demonstrated a remarkable level of commitment and energy to these innovative new degrees, and you could hear that from some of the earlier speakers, so I won't re repeat what they had to say. The many employers who have hired uh, PSM graduates, you've heard some examples, uh, today, everyone I've talked to is very happy with the people they've hired, with the background and the breadth and the integrated skills, both in the science or mathematics or whatever the technical field is, but also in those other skills that all employers, as far as I can tell, that they may just drink the same Kool-Aid or something, but they all say they're looking for people with exactly those skills beyond the science, mathematics, and engineering skills. And they've been very happy with this unique blend that uh, graduates from PSM programs bring with them. The, I, I do want to say a word about uh, some federal efforts in this regard that I think are important to recognize here. The National Science Foundation, for two years, ran something called the Science Master's Program. It was also very successful. It, is a, it was a PSM kind of initiative on, on the part of the National Science Foundation. 
They supported 22, I think, grants? 21, thank you. People are very precise in the <laughs> PSN. 21 grants in critical STEM areas. And the only unfortunate thing about that program is that it was funded under the American um, Recovery and Reconstruction Act. Is that what ARA was standing for? The ARA, and that lasted for only two years. So they are no longer uh, supporting that, and I think that is, that's unfortunate. But it was a very successful program. Uh, the other thing about federal agencies I want to say is that the recruitment by federal agencies has been smaller than it should have been. The evidence is less than 7% of the PSM graduates have been recruited. The final thing I want to say is the Sloan trustees uh, were very uh, creative in the way they dealt with this program. They made a 10-year commitment to support PSM initiatives if they uh, were showing signs of success, and they were, of course. As the 10th year arose, if you look at this graph, as the 10th year appeared, you have it in your folder, you can see that growth had been substantial, but it was not, not hugely rapid. It was growing, they were growing about 10 per year, and our perception on the staff level was that the PSM initiative was at a point of takeoff. And uh, they decided to extend their commitment for a further uh, two years. And if you look at the graph, you'll see they were right. The takeoff took place around 2008, and the, the inflection, the point of inflection in the curve was very substantial. The future of these degrees, I think, will depend upon continuation of this cooperation between higher education and employers that has driven their rapid expansion so far. And it would be awfully nice to see more involvement from the federal agencies. More recruitment is the most important thing. They should really be doing what the USPTO is doing and recruiting actively from PSM programs. So I think we have a great success story here. I think I can say the Sloan Foundation is very happy with what's happened and is proud to have contributed to this success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is the point where I was going to ask you, and I am going to ask you, to recognize all of our speakers who did such a good job. This was an extremely good uh, set of panelists. Let's, let's please thank them. Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it uh, valuable, and we hope to see you again.